Uh, just give me another minute here. Uh, <laughs> something just came up. I will be right back. And by minute, I mean like 30 seconds. And by something came up, I mean I forgot to refill my water. So, oops. And I do kind of need a lot of that. I am not a great orator. <laughs> I need water. And it is better to have too much water than it is for me to get dry mouth partway through, because nobody wants to hear that. That happened in some of my earlier streams when I wasn't as prepared. Um, now I'm more prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, I don't know that this week's going to be a super long one, but we'll see how we're doing. This is a late start, unfortunately, um, but uh, that uh, honestly, it was 100% avoidable and I just didn't avoid it. Um, <clears throat> everything's avoidable, so long as, you know, take pro appropriate action ahead of time. Schnikes, that's hot. Oi! Oi, oi, oi. Mmm, my taste buds. Oh, little friends, what did I ever do to you? Uh, let's see. Also, have some tea with me here. Uh, some Australian tea? Somebody was like, oh, you should totally take this. Australian Afternoon by Twinings. Congratulations, I shall now. Uh, so previously on, um, <laughs> we've been introduced to the character named Control. We've also incidentally heard his actual name, um, but uh, we will, in this book, practically never hear it until later. Uh, in fact, you know, you know things are going awry when you start hearing his actual name. Uh, I should look to see what his... It's something really simple. Yeah, John Rodriguez is his actual name, but we're not going to hear much of that. Parched as Johnny Tar. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Uh, so uh, we've been introduced to a fair cast of our characters here. We've been introduced to Control. Um, he is the Fixer, with a capital F. He gets sent in to clean up other people's messes. He also has a dark and mysterious past. He also comes from a dynasty of spooks. Uh, and by spooks, I mean G-men and women. In this case, from his mother's side. Uh, his mother, um, Jackie Severance, was uh, is a very, very well-storied spook. And he tries to follow in her footsteps. Um, so he's got mommy issues. <laughs> Uh, and he's, he's got issues. Like he's, he's like, we're going to learn what kind of issues he has. Like we, we've got vague inklings now and it's, it's going, other ones are going to become more apparent. Uh, control is easily the best name for him ever for a million reasons. Uh, let's see. We've been introduced to Grace, uh, who is the, uh, what is her official position? I'm about to say the wrong thing, so I don't want to do that. Uh, assistant director, theoretically, uh, but she's basically been the director in the interim uh, while the previous director was absent. Incidentally, the previous director has been absent because she was the psychologist in the previous book who went into Area X for reasons. We don't know what those are yet. <laughs> we will know what those are, sort of. We'll sort of know what those reasons are, sort of. 
We'll know reasons for her going into Area X as to whether those are the reasons that she went that time. Uh, spoilers. Um, as for reasons as to why she went uh, specifically, who knows? Um, we've been introduced to Whitby, uh, who we will come to know and love even more. Also, we've been introduced to The Voice, who is somebody hiding behind a voice modulator who talks to Control, is in many ways Control's control. Um, they are there to get the dope on what's going on at the, at the uh, Southern Reach, and uh, they also tell him what to do. So Control is not necessarily in Control. We also learn the backstory as to why he calls himself Control, and it's because he has um, grandpappy issues. He needs a therapist, is what I'm saying. He could probably use a therapist. Because <laughs> um, he's he's got baggage. Uh, he... Oh man, this guy This guy is packing an entire plane full of baggage, uh, as we will learn. Uh, we will not learn today, but we will learn. He has some baggage. Spoilers, he's got baggage. Uh, recurring themes in uh, the Southern Reach trilogy. Unreliable narrators. Uh, and Control is indeed somewhat unreliable. This kind of changes, actually, come the third book, where we have theoretically reliable narrators, uh, but things have progressed to a point where whether they're reliable or not is sort of inconsequential. And that will make sense when we get there. I promise. Probably. Uh, it's actually one of the things I like about the third book is the way the paradigm shifts. Um, <laughs> the thing I like about the series as a whole is how the paradigm shifts as the series goes on while also kind of working with its existing themes. As a writing exercise, this, the trilogy is a lot of fun. I think in terms of science, not so much. Not really a good science science fiction series, but um, definitely a lot of fun to read. Kind of like H.P. Lovecraft. With a lot less racism. A lot less. Thank goodness. Sorry, HP. Like, some of your work is brilliant, but man, man, was he not a great guy. <laughs> he was, whoo! Bad boys, bad boys. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when they wake up he who sleeps in the depths? All right, uh, so... Uh, Whitby, the last thing we heard was Whitby being... Um, cagey and mysterious about something that Control should see. Which we are not going to hear more about for a while. Brace thyselves. Zero, zero, 004 Reentry the car offered a little breathing room, a chance to decompress and transform from one thing to another. The town of Headley was a forty-minute drive from the southern reach. It lay against the banks of a river that, just twenty miles later, fed into the ocean. Headley was large enough to have some character and culture without being a tourist trap. I've been to that town. People moved there even though it fell just short of being... A good town to raise a family in. Between the sputtering shops huddled at one end of the short river walk and the canopy roads, there were hints of a certain quality of life, obscured in part by the strip malls that radiated outward from the edges of the city. It had a small private college, with a performing arts center. You could jog along the river or hike greenways. Still, though, Headley also partook of a certain languor that, especially in summers, could turn from charming to tepid overnight. A stillness when, when the breeze off the river died signaled a shift in mood, and some of the bars just off the waterfront had long been notorious for sudden, senseless violence. Places you didn't go unless you could pass for white, or maybe not even then. 
a town that seemed trapped in time, not much different from when Control had been a teenager. Headley's location worked for Control. He wanted to be close to the sea, but not on the coast. Something about the uncertainty of Area X had created an insistence inside of him on that point. His dream, in a way, forbid it. His dream told him he needed to be at a remove. On the plane down to his new assignment, he'd had strange thoughts about the inhabitants of those coastal towns to either side of Area X being somehow mutated under the skin. Whole communities no longer what they were once were, even though no one could tell this by looking. These were the kinds of thoughts you had to both keep at bay and fuel, if you could manage that trick. You, could, you couldn't become devoured by them, but you had to heed them. Because in Control's experience, they reflected something from the subconscious, some instinct you didn't want to go against. The fact was, the Southern Reach knew so little about Area X, even after three decades, that an irrational precaution might not be unreasonable. And Headley was familiar to him. This was the city to which he and his friends had come for fun on weekends, once some of them could drive, even knowing it was kind of a shithole, too. Just not as small a shithole as where they lived. Landlocked and forlorn. His mother had even alluded to it the last time he'd seen her. She'd flown in at his old job up north, which had been gradually reduced from analysis and management to a more reactive and administrative role. Due to his own baggage, he guessed. Due to the fact it always started out well, but then, if he stayed too long... Sometimes something happened, something he couldn't quite define. He became too invested. He became too empathic, or less so. It confused him when it all went to shit because he couldn't remember the point at which it had started to go bad. Was still convinced he could get the formula right. But his mother had come from Central, and they'd met in a conference room he probably he knew was probably bugged. Bugged. Had the voice traveled with her, been set up in a saltwater tank in the adjoining room? Because he thinks of him as a shark. It was, a, it was cold outside, and she wore a coat, an overcoat, and a scarf over a professional business suit and black high heels. She took off the overcoat and held it in her lap but she didn't take off the scarf. She looked as if she could surge from her chair at any moment and be out the door before he could snap his fingers. It had been five years since he'd seen her, predictably unreachable when he'd tried to get a message to her about her ex-husband's funeral, but she had aged only a little bit, her brown hair just as fashion model huge as ever, and eyes a kind of calculating blue peering out from a face on which wrinkles had encroached only around the corners of the eyes, and, hidden by the hair, across her forehead. She said, "'It will be like coming home, John, won't it?' nudging him, wanting him to say it, as if he were a barnacle clinging to a rock and she were a seagull, trying to convince him to release his grip. You'll be comfortable with the setting. You'll be comfortable with the people. He'd had to suppress anger mixed with ambivalence. How would she know whether she was right or wrong? She'd rarely been there, even though she'd had visitation rights. Just him and his father, dad beginning to fall apart by then, to eat too much, to drink a little too much, during a succession of flings once the divorce was final, then redirecting himself to an art no one wanted. Whoops. Then redirecting himself to art no one wanted. Getting his house in order and going off to college had been a guilty relief, to not live in that atmosphere any more. And, comfortably situated in this world I know so well, what would I do? She smiled at him. A genuine smile. He could tell the difference, having suffered so many times under the dull yellow glow of a fake one that tried to reheat his love for her. 
When she really smiled, when she meant it, his, father, his mother's face took on a kind of beauty that surprised anyone who saw it, as if she'd been hiding her true self behind a mask. While people who were always sincere rarely got credit for that quality. It's a chance to do better, she said. It's a chance to erase the past. The past? Which part of the past? The job up north had been his tenth posting in about fifteen years, which made the southern reach his eleventh. There were a number of reasons. There were always reasons. Or one reason, in his case. What would I have to do? If he had to pull it out of her, he knew it might not be something he wanted. But he was already tired of the repetitive nature of his current position, which had turned out to be less about fixing and more about repainting facades. He was tired of the office politics, too. Maybe that had always been his problem at heart. Maybe that had always been his problem at heart. You've heard of the Southern Reach? He had, mostly through a couple of colleagues who had worked there at one time. Vague allusions, keeping to the cover story about environmental catastrophe. Rumors of a chain of command that was eccentric at best. Rumors of significant variation, of there being more to the story. But then, there always was. He didn't know, on hearing his mother say those words, whether he was excited or not. And why me? The smile that prefaced her response was tinged with a bit of sadness or regret or something else that made Control look away. When she'd been on assignment, before she'd left for good, she'd had a short period when she'd been good at writing long, handwritten letters to him, almost as good as he had been at not finding the time or need to read them. But now he almost wished she was writing to him about the Southern Reach in a letter, not telling him about it in person. "'Because they're downsizing this department, although you might not know that, and you'll be on the chopping block, and this is the right fit for you.' That lurch in the pit of his stomach. Another change. Another city. Never any chance to catch his balance. The truth was that after Control had joined up, he had rarely felt like a flash of light. He had often felt heavy, and realized his mother probably felt heavy, too. That she had been feigning a kind of aloofness and lightness, hiding from him the weight of information, of history, and context. All of the things that wore you down, even as that was balanced by the electric feeling of being on the side of a border where you knew things that no one else knew. Is it the only option? Of course it was, since she hadn't mentioned any other options. Of course it was, since she hadn't traveled all this way just to say hello. He knew that he was the black sheep, that his lack of advancement reflected poorly on her had no idea what internecine battles she fought at the higher levels of clandestine departments so far removed from his security clearance that they might as well exist in the clouds among the angels. It might not be fair, John, I know that, but this might be your last chance, she said now, and now she wasn't smiling. Not smiling at all. At least it's the last chance I can get for you. For a permanent posting, an end to his nomadic lifestyle, or in general? For keeping a foothold in the agency? He didn't dare ask. The cold, roiling fear she'd put into him was too deep. He hadn't known he needed a last chance. The fear ran so deep that it pushed most other questions out of his head. He hadn't had a moment, then, to wonder if, perhaps, she wasn't just there to do her son a favor. Perhaps that perhaps she needed him to say yes. The teasing hook, to balance his fear, delivered light-heartedly and at the perfect moment. Don't you want to know more than I know? You will if you take this position. And nothing he could do about his response. It was true. He did. She hugged him when he said yes to the Southern Reach, which surprised him. The closer you are, the safer you are, she whispered in his ear. Closer to what? 
She smelled vaguely of an expensive perfume, the scent bit like the scent a bit like the plum trees in the backyard of the house they'd all shared up north. The little orchard he'd forgotten he'd forgotten about until just this moment. The swing set. The neighbor's malamute that always half heartedly chased him up the sidewalk. By the time the questions arose within him, it was too late. She had put on the overcoat and was gone, as if she'd never been there. Certainly there was no record of her ever signing in or signing out. Dusk, the start of the nightly reprieve from the heat, had settled over Headley by the time he pulled into the driveway. By the time he pulled into the driveway. It's one word. The place he'd rented sat up a, sat about a mile up to... Mm-hmm. The, the place he'd rented sat about a mile up a gentle slope of the hills that eventually ended below, at the banks of the river. A small, 1,300-square-foot cedar house painted light blue, with the white shutters on the windows slightly heat-warped. It had two bathrooms, a master bedroom, a living room, a galley kitchen, and an office, with a screened-in patio in back. The interior decoration was all in a cloying yet comfortable heirloom chic. In front, a garden of herbs and petunias that transitioned to a short stretch of lawn next to the driveway. As he walked up the steps to the front door, El Chorizo jumped out from the bushes to the side and got underfoot. El Chorizo was a huge black-and-white cat, a draft horse of a cat, named by his father. The family had had a pig named El Gato growing up, so this was his father's way of making a joke. Gato meaning cat, Chorizo meaning sausage. Control had taken him as a pet about three years ago, when the cancer had gotten bad enough that El Chorizo had become a burden. He'd always been an indoor-outdoor cat, and Control had decided to let him be that in his new surroundings, too. Apparently, it had been the right decision. El Chorizo, or Chori, as Control called him, looked alert and confident, even if his long hair was already tangled and dirty. Together they went inside, and Control put out some wet food in the kitchen, petted him for a few minutes, then listened to his messages, the landline just for civilians. There was only one message, from Mary Phillips, his girlfriend until they'd broken up about six months ago, checking in to make sure the move had gone okay. She had threatened to come visit, although he hadn't told her his precise location and had just gotten used to sleeping alone again. No hard feelings, and he couldn't even really remember if he had broken up with her or she with him. There rarely were hard feelings, which felt odd to him and wrong. Shouldn't there be? There had been almost as many girlfriends as postings. They usually didn't survive the moves, or his circumspection, or his odd hours, or maybe he just hadn't found the right person. He couldn't be sure, tried as the cycle... tried as the cycle... Is that tried? Yes, tried. <laughs> I just don't expect it to be tried. Tried, as the cycle kept repeating, to wring as much intensity and intimacy out of the early months, having a sense of how it would end. You're a strange kind of player, the one-night stand before Mary had said to him as he was going down on her, but he wasn't really a player. He didn't know what he was. Instead of returning the call, he slipped into the living room and sat on the couch. Chori promptly curled up next to him, and he absent-mindedly rubbed the cat's head. A wren, or some such, rooted around outside the window. There came, too, the call of a mockingbird, and a welcome chitter of bats, which weren't as common as it, which, which weren't as common anymore. Blech perils of doing this live. I don't get it right every time. 
It was so close to everything he knew from his teenage years that he decided to let that be a comfort, along with the house, which helped him believe that his job was going to last. But always have an exit strategy was something his mother had repeated ad nauseum from his first day of training, so he had the standard packet hidden in a false bottom to a suitcase. He'd brought more than just his standard sidearm, one of the guns stored with passports and money. Control had already unpacked, the idea of leaving things in storage painful. On the mantel over a brick fireplace that was mostly for show, he had placed a chessboard with the little brightly colored wooden figurines that had been his father's last redoubt. His father had sold them in local crafts shops and worked in a community center after his career had stalled. Occasionally, during the last decade of his father's life, an art collector would buy one of the huge art installations rusting under tarps in the backyard, but that was more like receiving a ghost, a time traveler, than anything like a revival of interest. The chessboard, frozen in time, reflected the progress of their last game together. He pulled himself off the couch, went into the bedroom, and changed into his shorts and t-shirt and running shoes. Chory looked up at him as if he wanted to come along. I know, I know, I just got home, but I'll be back. He slipped out the front door, deciding to leave Chory inside, put on his headphones, turned on some of the classical music he loved, and lit out along the street. By now, full dusk had arrived, and there was just a haze of dark blue remaining over the river below, and the lights of the homes and businesses, while above, the reflected glow of the city pushed the first stars further into the heavens. The heat had dropped away, but the insistent low chiseling noise of crickets and other insects brought back its specter. Something immediately felt tight in his left quad, but he knew it would work itself out. He started slowly, letting himself take in the neighborhood, which was mostly small houses like his, with rows of high bushes instead of fences, and streets that ran parallel to the ridge of the hill, with some connector streets running straight down. It didn't. He didn't mind the winding nature of it. He wanted a good three to five miles. The thick smell of honeysuckle came at him in waves as he ran by certain homes. Few people were still out except for some swing-sitters and dog-walkers, a couple of skateboarders. Most nodded at him as he passed. As he sped up and established a rhythm, headed ever downward toward the river, Control found himself in a space where he could think about the day. He kept reliving the meetings and, in particular, the questioning of the, of the biologist. He kept circling back to all of the information that had flooded into him, that he had let ke- that he had let keep flooding into him. Yes, okay, he's going with reiteration there. He kept circling back to all the information that had flooded into him, that he had let keep flooding into him. There would be more of it tomorrow and the day after that, and no doubt new information would keep entering him for a while before any conclusions came back out. He could try not to get involved at this level. He could try to exist only on some abstract level of management and administration, but he didn't believe that's really what the voice wanted him to do, or what the assistant director would let him do. How could he be the director of the Southern Reach if he didn't understand in his gut what the personnel there faced? He had already scheduled at least three more interviews with the biologist for the week, as well as a tour whoops, as well as a tour of the entry point into Area X at the border. He knew his mother would expect him to prioritize based on the situation on the ground. The border in particular stuck with him as he jogged. The absurdity of it coexisting in the same world as the town he was running through, the music he was listening to, the crescendo of strings and wind instruments. The border was invisible. It did not allow half measures. Once you touched it, it pulled you in. (laughs) Once you touched it, it pulled you in. Or across. It had discrete boundaries, including to about one mile out to sea. The military had 
put up floating berms and patrolled the area ceaselessly. He wondered, as he jumped over a low wall overgrown with kudzu, and took a shortcut between streets across a crumbling stone bridge. That sentence just ends there. Okay. He wondered, as he jumped over a low wall overgrown with kudzu and took a shortcut between streets across a crumbling stone bridge. He wondered for a moment about those ceaseless patrols, if they ever saw anything out there in the waves, or if their lives were just an excruciation of the same gray-blue details day after day. The border extended about 70 miles inland from the lighthouse, and approximately 40 miles east and 40 miles west along the coast. It ended just below the stratosphere, and, underground, just above the asthenosphere. It had a door or passageway through it, into Area X. The door might not have been created by whatever had created Area X. He passed a corner grocery store, a pharmacy, a neighborhood bar. He crossed the street and narrowly missed running into a woman on a bicycle. Abandoned the sidewalk for the side of the road when he had to, wanting now to get to the river soon, not looking forward to the run back up the hill. You could not get by... You could not get under the border by any means on the seaward side. You could not tunnel under it on the landward side. You could not penetrate it with advanced instrumentation, or radar, or sonar. From satellites peering down from above, you would see only wilderness in apparent real time, nothing out of the ordinary, even though this was an optical lie. The night the border had come down, it had taken ships and planes and trucks with it, anything that happened to be on or approaching that imaginary but too real line at the moment of its creation, and for many, ma and for many hours after, before anyone knew what was going on, knew enough to keep distant, before the army moved in. The plaintive groan of metal and the vibration of engines that continued running as they disappeared into something. Somewhere. A smoldering, apocalyptic vision, the con towers of a destroyer sent to investigate with the wrong intel, sliding into nothing, as one observer put it. The last shocked transmissions from the men and women on board, via video and radio, while most ran to the back in a churning, surging wave that, on the grainy helicopter video, looked like some enormous creature leaping off into the water because they were about to disappear and could do nothing about it, all of it complicated by the fog. Some, though, just stood there, watching as their ship disintegrated, and then they crossed over, or died, or went somewhere else, or... Control couldn't fathom it. Nice. It's a nautical joke. Fathom. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the hill leveled out, and he was put back on sidewalks, this time passing generic strip malls and chain stores, and people crossing at stoplights and people getting into cars in parking lots. Until he reached the main drag before the river, a blur of bright lights and more pedestrians, some of them drunk crossed it, and then came into a quiet neighborhood of mobile homes and tiny cinderblock houses. He was sweating a lot by now, despite the coolness. Someone was having a barbecue, and they all stopped to watch him as he ran by. His thoughts turned again to the biologist, to the need to know what the biologist had seen and experienced in Area X, aware of the fact that the assistant director might do more than threaten to take her away. Aware that the assistant director wanted to use that uncertainty to get him to make unsound decisions. A one-way road fringed with weeds and strewn with gravel from potholes led him down to the river. He emerged from a halo of branches onto a rickety pontoon dock, bent his knees to keep his balance. Finally came to a stop there, at the end of the dock, next to a speedboat lashed to it. 
Few lights across the river, just little clusters here and there, nothing compared to the roaring splash of lights to his left, where the river walk waited, under the deliberate touristy feature of stupid faux Victorian lamp posts, topped with globes full of, blur full of blurry, soft boiled eggs. Somewhere across the river, and off to the left, lay Area X, many miles away, but still visible somehow as a weight, a shadow, a glimmering. Expeditions would have been coming back or not coming back while he was still in high school. The psychologist would have been transitioning to director at some point as well. A whole secret history had been playing out while he and his friends drove into Headley, intent on scoring some beers and, far f and finding a party, not necessarily in that order. He'd had a phone call with his mother the day before he'd boarded the plane, headed for the Southern Reach. They'd talked a little bit about his connection to Headley. She'd said, I only knew the area because you were there, but you don't remember that. No, he didn't. Nor had he known that she had worked briefly for the Southern Reach, a fact that both did and didn't surprise him. I worked there to be closer to you, she said, and something in his heart loosened, even as he wasn't sure whether to believe her. Because it was so hard to tell. At that time, he would have been receiving her time-lapse stories from earlier assignments. He tried to fast-forward, figure out when, if ever, she'd told him a disguised version of the Southern Reach. He couldn't find the point, or he couldn't find the point, or his memory just didn't want to give it to him. "'What did you do there?' he'd asked, and the only word back had been a wall. "'Classified.' He turned off his music, stood there listening to the croaking of frogs, the lap and splash of water against the side of the speedboat as a breeze rippled across the river. The dark was more complete here, and the stars seemed closer. The flow of the river had been faster back in the day, but the runoff from agribusiness had generated silt that slowed it, stilled it, and changed what lived in it and where. Hidden by the darkness of the opposite shore lay paper mills and the ruins of earlier factories, still polluting the groundwater. All of it coursing into seas ever more acidic. There came a distant shout across the river, and an even more distant reply. Something small snuffled and quirked its way through the reeds to his right. A deep breath of fresh air was limbed by a faint but sharp marsh smell. It was the kind of place where he and his father would have gone canoeing when he was a teenager. It wasn't true wilderness, was comfortingly close to civilization, but existed just enough apart to create a boundary. This was what most people wanted, to be close to, but not part of. They didn't want the fearful unknown of a pristine wilderness. They didn't want a soulless artificial life, either. Now he was John Rodriguez again control falling away. John Rodriguez, son of a sculptor whose parents had come to this country looking for a better life. Son of a woman who believed, son of a woman who lived in a Byzantine realm of secrets. By the time he started back up the hill, he was thinking about whether he should just pursue an exit strategy now. Load everything in the car and leave, not have to face the assistant director again, or any of it. It always started well. It might not end well. But he knew that when morning came, he would rise as control, and that he would go back to the Southern Reach. Rites, as in of spring, R-I-T-E-S. Curse you homophones! 
actually makes reading aloud kind of hard. I'm just thankful that I'm not reading Born by uh, by Jeff Vandermeer, because that is filled with word jokes uh, that don't that I would have to be explaining like every other chapter. Unlike, um, say, uh, Peter Watts, where I'm just like giggling every time he says Alec Watts or um, Benthic, because he's literally the only author I've ever read that has used those words. <laughs> Thank you, Peter Watts. Now back to Jeff Vandermeer. 005, The First Breach. What is it? Is it on me? Where is it on me? Is it on me? Where on me? Can you see it on me? Can you see it? Where is it on me? Morning. After a night filled with dreams from atop a cliff, staring down. Control stood in the parking lot of a diner with his go-to cup of coffee and his breakfast biscuit, staring from two cars away at a thirty-something white woman in a purple business suit. Even gyrating to find the velvet ant that had crawled onto her, she looked like a real estate agent, with careful makeup and blonde hair in a short pageboy cut. But her suit didn't fit well, and her fingernails were uneven, her red nail polish eroded, and he felt her distress extended well back beyond the ant. The ant was poised on the back of her neck, unmoving for a moment. If he'd told her, she would have smacked it dead. Sometimes you had to keep things from people just so they wouldn't do the first thing that came into their heads. Hold still he told her as he set his coffee and biscuit atop the trunk of his car. It's harmless, I'll get it off you. Because no one else seemed of any use. Most were ignoring her, while some, as they got into or out of their cars and SUVs, were laughing at her. But Control wasn't laughing. He didn't find it amusing. He didn't know where Area X was on him, either, and all the questions in his head seemed in that moment as frenetic and useless as the woman's questions. "'Okay, okay,' she said, still upset as he curled around and brought his hand down level with the ant, which, after a bit of gentle prodding, climbed on board. It had been struggling to progress across the field of golden hairs on the woman's neck. Red-banded and soft yet prickly, it roamed across his hand in an aimless fashion. The woman shook her head, craned her neck as if trying to see behind her, gave him a hesitant smile, and said, Thanks! Then bolted for her car as if late for an appointment, or afraid of him, the strange man who had touched her neck. Control took the ant into the fringe of vegetation lining the parking lot, and let it crawl from his thumb onto the wood chips there. The ant quickly got its bearings, and walked off with purpose toward the green strip of trees that lay between the parking lot and the highway, governed by some sense of where it was and where it needed to be that was beyond Control's understanding. So long as you don't tell people you know, so long as you don't tell people you don't know something, they'll probably think you know it. That from his father, not his mother, surprisingly, or perhaps not. His mother soon knew so much that maybe she thought she didn't need to pretend. Was he the woman with no clue where the ant was, or the ant unaware it was on the woman? I've read that book by Franz Kafka. Control spent the first fifteen minutes of his morning searching for the key to the locked desk drawer. He wanted to solve that mystery before his appointment with the greater mystery posed by the biologist. His stale breakfast biscuit, cooling cup of coffee, and satchel lay graceless to the side of his computer. He didn't feel particularly hungry anyway. The rancid cleaning smell had invaded his coffee. His office. Coffee is right above it. When he found the key, he sat there for a moment, staring at it, and then at the locked drawer and the early earthy stain across the bottom left corner. As he turned the key in the lock, he suppressed the ridiculous thought that he should have someone else present, Whitby perhaps, and he, when he opened it. 
there was something dead inside and something living. The plant grew in the drawer, had been growing there in the dark this whole time, crimson roots attached to a nodule of dirt, as if the director had pulled it out of the ground and then, for whatever reason, placed it in the drawer. Eight slender leaves, deep, a deep, almost luminous green, protruded from the ridged stem at irregular intervals to form a pleasing circular pattern when viewed from above. From the side, though, the plant had the look of a creature trying to escape, with a couple of limbs, finally freed, reflexively curled over the edge of the drawer. At the base, half embedded in the clump of dirt, lay the desiccated corpse of a small brown mouse. Control couldn't be certain the plant hadn't been feeding on it on it hadn't been feeding on it somehow. Next to the plant lay an old first generation cell phone in a battered black leather case, and underneath both plant and phone he found stacked sedimentary layers of water damaged file folders almost as if someone had, bizarrely, come in and watered the plant from time to time. With the director gone, who had been doing that? Who had done that rather than remove the plant, the mouse? Control stared at the mouse corpse for a moment, and then reluctantly reached beside it to rescue the phone. The case looked a little melted, and, with the tip of a pen, teased open the edges of a file or two. These weren't official files, from what he could tell, but instead were full of handwritten notes, scraps of newspaper, and other secondary materials. He caught glimpses of words that alarmed him, let the pages fall, bla fall back into place. The effect was oddly as if the director had been creating a compost pile for the plant, one full of eccentric intel. Or some ridiculous science project. Mouse-powered irrigation system for data relay and biosphere maintenance. He'd seen weirder things at high school science fairs, although his own lack of science acumen meant that when extra credit had been dangled in front of him, he'd stuck to time-honored classics like miniature volcanoes or growing potatoes from other potatoes. Or potatoes, if you will. Perhaps, Control conceded as he rummaged a bit more, the assistant director had been correct. Perhaps he would have been better off taking a different office. Sidling out from behind his desk, he looked for something to put the plant in, found a pot behind a stack of books. Maybe the director had been searching for it, too. Maybe the director had been searching for it, too. Using a few random pages from the piles stacked around his desk, if they held the secret to Area X, so be it. Control carefully removed the mouse from the dirt and tossed it in the garbage. Then he lifted the plant into the pot and set it on the edge of his desk, as far away from him as possible. Now what? He debugged and demoused the office. All that was left, beyond the Herculean task of cleaning up the stacks and going through them, was the closed second door that led nowhere. Fortifying himself with a sip of bitter coffee, Control went over to the door. It took a few minutes to clear the books and other detritus from in front of it. Right. Last mystery about to be revealed. He hesitated for a moment, irritated by the thought that all of these little peculiarities would have to be reported to the voice. He opened the door. He stared for several minutes. After a while, he closed it again. Which is very much the reaction of someone who just came to the conclusion... It is too early in the morning to deal with this shit. I will think about this later. And when you learn what's behind the door, you will very much agree with his position. <laughs> it will make sense. His reaction is on point. Zero, zero, 006. Why am I spoiling this book? It's so good not to spoil. Gosh darn it. It's because I can only do these in like one and a half to two hour chunks. 
006. Typographical anomalies. Same interrogation room, same worn chairs, same uncertain light, same ghost bird. Or was it? The residue of an unfamiliar gleam or glint in her eyes or her expression, he couldn't figure out which. Something he hadn't caught during their first session. She seemed both softer and harder-edged than before. If someone seems to have changed from one session to another, make sure you haven't changed instead. A warning from his mother, once upon a time, delivered as if she'd upended a box of spy advice fortune cookies and chosen one at random. Control casually set the pot on the table to his left, placed her file between them as the ever-present carrot. Was that a slightly raised eyebrow in response to the pot? He couldn't be sure. But she said nothing, even though a normal person might have been curious. On a whim, Control had retrieved the mouse from the trash and placed it in the pot with the plant. In that depressing place, it looked like trash. Control sat. He favored her with a thin smile, but still received no response. He had already decided not to pick up where they had left off, with the drowning, even though that meant he had to fight off his own sudden need to be direct. The words Control had found scrawled on the wall beyond the door kept curling through his head in an unpleasant way. Where lies the strangling fruit that came from the hand of the sinner I shall bring forth the seeds of the dead? A plant. A dead mouse. Some kind of insane rant. Or some kind of prank or joke. Or continued evidence of a downward spiral, a leap off the cliff into an ocean filled with monsters. Maybe at the end, before she shoehorned herself into the Twelfth Expedition, the director had been practicing for some perverse form of scrabble. Nor could the assistant director be entirely innocent of this devolution. Another reason Control was happy she wouldn't be watching from behind the one-way glass. Stealing a trick he'd learned from a colleague who had done it to him at his last job, Control had given Grace an afternoon time for the session. Then he had walked down to the expedition holding area, spoken to the security guard, and had the biologist brought to the debriefing room. As he dove in, without preamble this time, Control ignored the water stains on the ceiling that resembled variously an ear and a giant subaqueous eye staring down. There's a topographical... <laughs> There's a topographical anomaly in Area X, fairly near base camp. Did you or any members of your expedition find this topographical anomaly? If so, did you go inside? In actual fact, most of those who encountered it called it a tower, or a tunnel, or even a pit, but he stuck with topographical anomaly, in hopes she would give, a more, give it a more specific name on her own. I don't remember. Her constant use of those words had begun to grate, or perhaps it was the words on the wall that grated, and the consistency of her stance was just pushing that irritation forward. Are you sure? Of course she was sure. I think I would remember forgetting that. When Control met her gaze now, it was always to the slightly upraised corners of her mouth, eyes that had a light in them so different from the last session. For reasons he couldn't fathom, that frustrated him. This was not the same person, was it? This isn't a joke, he said, deciding to see how she would react if he seemed irritated. Except he really was irritated. I do not remember. What else can I say? Each word said as if he were a bit slow and hadn't understood the first time. A vision of his couch in his new home, of Chori curled up on his lap, of music playing, of a book in hand. A better place than here. That you do remember, that you are holding something back. Pushing. Some people wanted to please their questioners. Others didn't care, or deliberately wanted to obstruct. 
The thought had occurred from the first session and the transcripts of the other of and the transcripts of three other sessions before he'd arrived that the biologist might float back and forth between these extremes, not know her own mind, or be severely conflicted. What could he do to convince her? A potted mouse had not moved her. A change of topic hadn't either. The biologist said nothing. Improbable, he said, as if she had denied it again. So many other expeditions have encountered this topographical anomaly. A mouthful topographical anomaly. The book says that. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> I swear. Ah! He has crawled out of his code to see the sun. Thanks for tuning in, optical antenna. Even so, she said, I don't remember a tower. Tower. Not tunnel or pit or cave or hole in the ground. Why do you call it a tower? He said. He asked, pouncing. Too eager, he realized a moment later. A grin appeared on Ghost Bird's face, and a kind of remote affection. For him? Because of some thought that his words had... Excuse me. Because of some thought that his words had triggered? Did you know, she replied, that the forest snail attaches the empty shells of other snails onto its own shell? As a result, the saltwater forest snail is very clumsy. It staggers and tumbles about because of these empty shells, which offer camouflage, but at a price. The deep well of secret mirth behind the answer stung him. Perhaps, too, he had wanted to her... Sh <laughs> let's skip three words ahead, let's skip three words back, and then mm, mangle the sentence entirely. Perhaps, too, he had wanted her to share his disdain for the term topographical anomaly. It had come up during his initial briefing with Grace and other members of the staff. As some topographical anomaly expert had droned on about its non-aspects, basically, create, basically creating an outline for what they didn't know, Control had felt a heat rising, the ho a whole monologue rising with it. Channeling Grandpa Jack, who could work himself into a mighty rage when he wanted to, especially when confronted by the stupidities of the world. His grandpa would have stood and said something like, Topological anomaly? Topological anomaly? Don't you mean witchcraft? Don't you mean the end of civilization? Don't you mean some kind of spooky thing that we know nothing, absolutely fucking nothing about, to go with everything else we don't know? Just a shadow on a blurred photo, a curling nightmare expressed by the notes of a few unreliable witnesses. Made more unreliable through hypnosis, perhaps, no matter Central's protestations. Protestations? A spiraling thread gone astray that might or might not be made of something else entirely. Not even as scrutable in its eccentricity as a house squatter of a snail that stumbled around like a drunk. No hope of knowing what it was, or even just blasting it to hell because that's what intelligent apes do. Just some other thing in the ground, mentioned casu as casually, as matter-of-factly as manhole cover, or water faucet, or steak knives. Topographical anomaly. But he had said most of this to the bookshelves in his office on Tuesday, to the ghost of the director while at a snail's pace beginning to sort through her notes. Grace, to Grace and the rest of them, he had said, in a calm voice, Is there anything else you can tell me about? But they couldn't. Any more, apparently, than could the biologist. Control just stared at her for a moment, the interrogator's creepy prerogative, usually meant to intimidate. 
but Ghost Bird met his stare with those sharp green eyes until he looked away. It continued to nag at him that she was different today. What had changed in the past twenty-four hours? Her routine was the same, and surveillance hadn't revealed anything different about her mental state. They'd offered her a carefully monitored phone call with her parents, but she'd had nothing to say to them. Boredom from being cooped up with nothing but a DVD player and a censored selection of movies and novels could not account for it. The food she ate was from the cafeteria, so Control could commiserate with her there, but this still did not provide a reason. Perhaps this will jog your memory. Or stop you lying. He began to read summaries of accounts from prior expeditions. An endless pit burrowing into the ground. We could never get to the bottom of it. We could never stop falling. A tower that had fallen into the earth that gave off a feeling of intense unease. None of us wanted to go inside, but we did. Some of us. Some of us came back. There was no entrance, just a circle of pulsing stone, just a sense of great depth. Only two members of that expedition had returned, but they had brought their colleagues' journals, which were filled with drawings of a tower, a tunnel, a pit, a cyclone, a series of stairs, where they were not filled with images of more mundane things. No two journals were the same. Control did not continue for long. He had begun the recitations aware that the selected readings might contaminate the edges of her amnesia, if she actually suffered from memory loss, and that feeling had quickly intensified. But it was mostly his own sense of unease that made him pause, and then stop. His feeling that in making the tower pit more real in his imagination, he was also making it more real in fact. But Ghostbird either had had not But Ghostbird either had not or had picked up on his tiny moment of distress, because she said, Why did you stop? He ignored her, switched one tower for another. What about the lighthouse? What about the lighthouse? First thought, she's mimicking me which brought back a middle school memory of humiliation from bullies before the transformation in high school as he'd put his efforts into football and tried to think of himself as a spy in the world of jocks, realized that the words on the wall had thrown him off. Not by much, but just enough. Do you remember it? I do, she said, surprising him. Still, he had to pull it out of her. What do you remember? Approaching it from the trail through the weeds through the reeds with an r approaching it through the trail through the re from the trail through the give me a sec this happens sometimes tune into anyone tuning in for the first time this is not the first time this has happened sorry we do it live approaching it from the trail through the reeds looking in the doorway and what did you see the inside. It went that way for a while, with Control beginning to lose track of her answers. Moving on to the next thing she said she couldn't remember, letting the conversation fall into a rhythm, one that she might find comfortable. He told himself he was trying to get a sense of her nervous tics, of anything that might give, her a, might give away her real state of mind or her real agenda. It wasn't actually dangerous to stare at her. It wasn't dangerous at all. He was control, and he was in control. Oh boy, here we go. Run on sentences. Let's go. Where lies the strangling fruit that came from the hand of the sinner? I shall bring forth the seeds of the dead to share with the worms that gather in the darkness and surround the world with the power of their lives, while from the dim lit halls of other places forms that never could be writhe for the, for the impatience of the few who have never seen or been seen. In the black water, with the sun shining at midnight, those fruits shall come ripe, and in the darkness of that which is golden shall split open to reveal 
feel the revelation of the fatal softness in the earth. The shadows of the abyss are like the petals of a monstrous flower that shall blossom within the skull and expand the mind beyond what any man can bear. And on and on it went, so that Control had the impression that if the director hadn't run out of space, hadn't added a map of Area X, she wouldn't have run out of words, either. At first, she, at first he had thought the wall beyond the door was covered in a dark design. But no, someone had obliterated it with a series of odd sentences, written with a remarkably thick black pen. Some words had been underlined in red, and others boxed in by green. The weight of them had made him take a step back, then just stand there, frowning. Initial theory, abandoned as ridiculous. The words were the director's psychotic ode to the plant in her desk drawer. Then he was drawn to the slight similarities between the cadence of the words and some of the more religious anti-government militias he had monitored during his career. Then he thought he detected a faint murmur of the tone of the kinds of sloth-like sloth -like yet finicky lunatics who stuck newspaper articles and internet printouts to the walls of their mother's basements, creating, glue-stick by glue-stick and thumbtack by thumbtack, their own single-use universes. But such tracts, such philosophies, rarely seemed as melancholy or as earthy yet ethereal as these sentences. What had burned brightest within control as he stared at the wall was not confusion or fear, but the irritation he had brought into his session with the biologist. An emotion that manifested as surprise, cold water dumped into an unsuspecting empty glass. Inconsequential things could lead to failure, one small breach creating another. Then they grew larger, and soon you were in free fall. It could be anything. Forgetting to enter field notes one afternoon, getting too close to a surveillance subject, skimming a file you should have read with your full attention. Control had not been briefed on the words on the director's wall, and he had seen nothing about them in any of the files he had so meticulously read and reread. It was a first it was the first indication of a flaw in his process. When Control thought the biologist was truly comfortable and feeling pleased with herself, and perhaps even very clever, he said, You say your last memory of Area X was of drowning in the lake. What do you remember specifically? The biologist was supposed to blanch, gaze turning inward, and give him a sad smile that would make him sad too, as if she had become disappointed in him for some reason. That somehow he'd been doing so well and now he'd fucked up. Then she would protest, would say, it wasn't the lake, it was in the ocean, and all of the rest would come spilling out. But none of that happened. He received no smile of any kind. Instead, she locked everything away from him, and even her gaze withdrew to some far-off height, a lighthouse, perhaps, from which she looked down at him from a safe distance. I was confused yesterday, she said. It wasn't in Area X. It was my memory from when I was five, of almost drowning in a public fountain. I hit my head. I had stitches. I don't remember why, but that's what came back to me, in pieces, when you asked that question. He almost wanted to clap. He almost wanted to stand up, clap, and hand over her file. She had sat in her room last night, bored out of her mind from lack of stimuli, and she had anticipated this question. Not only had she anticipated it, Ghostbird had decided to turn it into an egg laid by control. Give away a less personal detail to protect something more important. The fountain incident was a well-documented part of her file, since she'd had to go to the hospital for stitches. It might confirm for him that she remembered something of her childhood, but nothing more. It occurred to him that perhaps he wasn't entitled to her memories. Perhaps no one was. 
but he pushed himself away from that thought, like an astronaut pushing off from the side of a space capsule. Where he'd end up was anyone's guess. I don't believe you, he said flatly. I don't care, she said, leaning back in her chair. When do I get out of here? Oh, you know the drill. You've got to take one for the team, he said, using clichés to breeze past her question, trying to sound ignorant or dumb. Not so much a strategy as to... Not so much a strategy as to punish himself for not bringing his A-game. You signed the agreement. You knew the debriefing might take a while. You knew, too, that you might come back with cancer, or not come back at all. I don't have a computer, she said. I don't have any of the books I requested. I'm being kept in a cell that has a tiny window high up on the wall. It only shows the sky. If I'm lucky, I see a hawk wheel by every few hours. It's a room, not a cell. It was both. I can't leave, so it's a cell. Give me my give me books at least. But he couldn't give her the books she wanted on memory loss. Not until he knew more about the nature of her, about the nature of her memory loss. She had also asked for all kinds of text about mimicry and camouflage. He'd have to question her about that at some point. Does this mean anything to you? He asked to deflect her attention, pushing the potted plant mouse across the table to her. She sat straight in her chair, seemed to become not just taller but wider, more imposing, as she leaned in toward him. A plant and a dead mouse? It's a sign you should give me my fucking books and a computer. Perhaps it wasn't amusement that made her different today. Maybe it was a sense of recklessness. I can't. Then you know what you can do with your plant and your mouse. All right, then. Her contemptuous laughter followed him out into the hall. She had a nice laugh, even when she was using it as a weapon against him. Zero zero seven superstition. Twenty minutes later, Control had contrived to cram Whitby, Grace, and the staff linguist, Jessica Sue, into, a, into cramped quarters in front of the revealed section of wall with the director's peculiar handwritten words scrawled across it. Control hadn't bothered to move books or much of anything else. He wanted them to have to sit in close, uncomfortable proximity. He wanted them to have to sit in close, uncomfortable proximity. Let us bond in this phone booth, with our knees shoved up against one another's. Little fabric sounds, mouth breathing, shoe squeaks, unexpected smells, all would be magnified. He thought of it as a bonding experience. Perhaps. Only the assistant director had gotten a regular-sized chair. That way, she could hold on to the illusion that she was in charge. Or, rather, he hoped he could forestall any complaint from her later that he was being petty. He had already ignored Grace's pointed, I am so thankful that this is correct on the schedule, which meant she already knew he'd moved up his interrogation of the biologist. She'd kept him waiting while she joked with someone in the hall, which he took as a micro-retaliation. They were huddled around the world's smallest conference table slash stool, on which Control had placed the pot with the plant and mouse. Everything in its time and place, although the director's cell phone would not be part of the conversation. Grace had already confiscated it. What is this? He pointed, pointing to the. W he said, pointing to the wall of words, in my office. Not quite willing to concede the unspoken point that continued to radiate from Grace like a force field, it was still the former director's office. This included not just the words, but the crude map of Area X drawn beneath the words, in green, red, and black, showing the usual landmarks. Lighthouse, topographical anomaly, base camp, and also, farther up the coast, the island. 
A few stray words had been scribbled with a ballpoint pen out to the sides, incomprehensible, and there were two rather daunting slash marks about half a foot above Control's head, with dates about three years apart. One red, one green. With the director's initials beside them, too. Had the director been checking her height? Of all the strange things on the wall, that seemed the strangest. I thought you said you read all the files. Grace replied. Nothing in the files had mentioned a door's worth of peculiar text, but he wouldn't argue the point. He knew it was unlikely he had uncovered something unknown to them. Humor me. The director wrote it, Grace said. These are words for found written on the walls of the tunnel. Control took a moment to digest that information. But why did you leave it there? For an intense moment, the words and the rotting honey smell combined to make him feel physically ill. A memorial, Whitby said quickly, as if to provide an excuse for the assistant director. It seemed uh, too disrespectful to take it down. Control had noticed Whitby kept giving the mouse strange glances. Not a memorial, Grace said. It's not a memorial because the director isn't dead. I don't believe she's dead. She said this in a quiet but assured way, causing a hush from Whitby and Sue. Sue, as if Grace had shared an opinion that was an embarrassment to them. Control's careful manipulation of the thermostat meant that they were sweating and squirming a bit anyway. What does it mean? Control asked, to move past the moment. Beyond Grace's obstructionism, he could see a kind of pain growing in her that he had no wish to exploit. "'That's why we brought the linguist,' Whitby said charitably, even though it was clear that Sue's presence had surprised the assistant director. But Sue had ever more influence as... Yes, I am reading that correctly. But Sue had ever more influence as the Southern Reach shrank. Soon enough, they might have a situation where sub-departments consisted of one person writing themselves up for offenses, giving themselves raises and bonuses, celebrating their own birthdays with custom-made Southern Reach-shaped carrot cakes. Sue, a short, slender woman with long black hair, spoke. First of all, we are 99.9% .9 certain that this text is by the lighthouse keeper, Saul Evans. A slight uprising inflection to her voice imbued even the blandest or most serious statement with optimism. Saul Evans. He's right up there, Whitby said, pointing to the wall of framed images, in the middle of that black and white photo. The one in front of the lighthouse. So that was Saul. He'd known that already, somewhere in the back of his mind. Because you found it printed somewhere else? Control asked Sue. He hadn't had time to do more than glance at the file on Evans. He'd been too busy familiarizing himself with the staff of the Southern Reach and the general outline of the situation in Area X. Because it matches his syntax and word choice for in a few of his sermons we have on audio tape. What was he doing preaching if he was a lighthouse keeper? He was retired as a preacher, actually. He left his ministry up north very suddenly for no documented reason, and then came south and took the lighthouse keeper position. He'd been down there for five years when the border came down. Do you think he brought whatever caused Area X with him? Control ventured, but no one followed him to the hinterlands. It's been checked out, Whitby said. For the first time, a sliver of condescension had entered his voice when addressing Control. And these words were found within the topographical anomaly? Yes, Sue said. Reconstructed from the reports of several expeditions, but we've never gotten a useful sample of the material the words are made of. Living material, Control said. Now it was coming back to him a bit. The words hadn't been part of the summary, but he'd seen reports of words written on the tower walls in living tissue. Why weren't these words in the files? The linguist, again, this time with some reluctance. 
to be honest, we don't like to reproduce the words, uh, so it might have been buried in the information, like in a summary in the lighthouse keeper's file. Grace had nothing to add, apparently, but Whitby chimed in. We don't like to reproduce the words because we still don't know exactly what triggered the creation of Area X. Or why. And yet they'd left the words up behind the door that led nowhere. Control was struggling to see the logic there. That's superstition, Sue protested. That's complete and utter superstition. You shouldn't say that. Control knew her parents were very traditional, and came from a culture in which spirits manifested and words had a different significance. Sue did not share these beliefs, vehemently did not, practicing a lax sort of Christian faith, which brought with it inexplicable elements and phantasmagoria all its own. But he still agreed with her assessment, even if that antipathy might be leaking into her analysis. She would have continued with a full-blown excoriation of superstition, except that Grace stopped her. "'It's not superstition,' she said. They all turned to her, swiveling on their stools. "'It is superstition,' she admitted, "'but it might be true.'" How could a superstition be true? Control pondered that later, as he turned his attention to his trip to the border along with a cursory look at a file Whitby had pulled for him titled simply, Theories. Maybe superstition was what snuck into the gaps, the cracks, when you worked in a place with falling morale and depleted resources. Maybe superstition was what happened when your director went missing in action, and your assistant director was still mourning the loss. Maybe that was when you fell back on spells and rituals, the reptile brain saying to the rest of you, I'll take it from here, you've had your shot. It wasn't even unreasonable, really. How many invisible, abstract incarnations ruled the world beyond the southern reach? But not everyone believed in the same versions. The linguist still believed in the superstition of logic, for example, because she had only been at the Southern Reach for two years. If the, st if the statistics held true, she would burn out within the next 18 months. For some reason, Area X was very hard on linguists, almost as hard as it was on priests, of which, were there, no of which there were none now at the Southern Reach. But we're certainly in the employ at some point. Uh, I just lost my place. That's really good. For some reason, Area X was very hard on linguists, almost as hard as it was on priests, of which there were none now at the Southern Reach. So perhaps she was only months removed from converting to the assistant director's belief system, or Whitby's, whatever that might be. Because Control knew that belief in a scientific process only took you so far. The ziggurats of Ill, of Ill logic, erected by your average domestic terrorist, as he or she bought the fertilizer or made a detonator, took on their own teetering momentum and power. When those towers crashed to the earth, they still existed whole in the perpetrator's mind, and everyone else's too, just for different reasons. But Sue had been adamant, for reasons that didn't make control any more comfortable about Area X. Imagine, she had told Control Next, that language is only part of a method of communication. Imagine that it isn't even the important part, but more like the pipeline, the highway. A conduit only. Infrastructure was the word Control would use with the voice later. The real core of the message, the meaning, would be conveyed by the combinations of living matter that composed the words, as if the ink itself was the message. And if a message is half physical, a kind of, if a kind of coding is half physical, then the words on a wall don't mean that much at all, really, in my opinion. I could analyze those words for years, which is, incidentally, what I understand the director may have done, and it wouldn't help me to understand anything, 
The type of conduit helps decide how fast the message arrives, and perhaps some context, but that's all. Further, and here Control recognized that Sue had slipped into the rote routine of a lecture given many times before, possibly accompanied by a PowerPoint presentation, if someone or something is trying to jam information inside your head using words you understand but are meaning you don't, it's not even... It's not even that it's not on a bandwidth you can receive. It's much worse. Like, if the message were a knife and it created its meaning by cutting into meat and your head is the receiver and the tip of that knife is being shoved into your ear over and over and over again... She didn't need to say more for Control to think of the expeditions come to grief before they had banned names and modern communication technology. What if the fate of the first expedition in particular had been sealed by a kind of interference they had brought with them that had made them simply unable to listen, to perceive? He returned to the lighthouse keeper. So we think Saul Evans wrote all of this long ago, right? He can't possibly be writing anything now, though. He'd be ancient at this point. We don't know. We just don't know. This, unhelpfully, from Whitby, while they all gave him a look like animals caught in the middle of the road late at night with a car coming fast. Zero, zero, 008 The Terror An hour or so later, it was time to visit the border. Grace telling him that Cheney would take him on the tour. He wants to, for some reason. And Grace didn't, clearly. Down the corridor again to those huge double doors, led by Whitby, as if Control had no memory, only to be greeted by a cheerful Cheney, whose brown leather jacket seemed not so much ubiquitous or wedded to him as part of him, a beetle's carapace. Whitby faded into the background, disappearing through the doors with a conspicuous and sharp intake of breath, as if about to dive into a lake. "'I thought I'd come up and spare you the dread gloves!' Cheney exclaimed as he shook Control's hand. Control wondered if there was some cunning in his, uh, in his affabil- to his- Okay. Control wondered if there was some cunning to his affability, or if that was just paranoia spilling over from his interactions with Grace. Why keep them there? Control asked as Cheney led him via a circuitous shortcut past security and out to the parking lot. Budget, I'm afraid. Always the answer around here, Cheney said. Too expensive to remove them. Then it became a joke. Or we made it into a joke. A joke? He'd had enough of jokes today. At the entrance, Whitby miraculously awaited them at the wheel of an idling army jeep with the top down. He looked like a silent movie star, the person meant to take the pratfalls, and his pantomimed unfurling of his hand to indicate they should get on board only intensified the impression. God, that's spooky, because I just got done watching a bunch of uh, Buster Keaton. That's wild. Um, <laughs> that's like, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> it's so topical, oh my god, it's like my life. Um, <laughs> don't do those asides, you lose your place. He looked like a silent movie star, the person meant to take the pratfalls, and his pantomimed unfurling of his hand to indicate they should get on board only intensified the impression. Control gave Whitby an eye roll, and Whitby winked at him. Had Whitby been a member of the drama club in college? Was he a thwarted thespian? Yes, a, a joke, Cheney continued, agreeable. As they jumped into the back, Whitby or someone had conspicuously put a huge file box in the front passenger seat so no one could sit there. As if whatever is strange and needs to be analyzed comes to us from the building, not from Area X. Have you met those people? We're a bunch of lunatics. A bullfrog-like smile. Another joke. Whitby, take the scenic route. But Control was hardly listening. He was, welcome he was wrinkling his nose at the unwelcome fact that the rotting honey smell had followed them into the jeep. Oh, 
For a long time, Whitby spoke not at all, and Cheney and set and Cheney said things Control already knew, playing tour guide and apparently forgetting he was repeating things from the bunny briefing just the day before. So Control focused most of his attention on his surroundings. The scenic route took them the usual way Control had seen on maps. The winding road, the roadblocks, the trenches like remnants from an ancient war. Where possible, the swamp and forest had been retained as natural cover or barriers. But odd bald patches of drained swamp and clear-cut forest appeared at intervals, sometimes with guard stations or barracks placed there, but often just turned into meadows of yellowing grass. Control got a prickling on his neck that made him think of snipers and of remote watchers. Maybe it helped flush out intruders for the drones. Most army personnel they passed were in camouflage, and it was hard for him to judge their numbers. But he knew everyone they passed outside the last checkpoint thought what lay beyond was an area rendered hazardous due to environmental contamination. In cooperation with the Southern Reach, the army had been tasked with finding new entry points into Area X, and relentlessly or, perhaps, with growing boredom, monitored the edges for breaches. The army also still tested the border with projectiles from time to time. He knew, too, that nukes were locked in on Area X from the nearest silos, military satellites keeping watch from above. But the army's primary job was to work hard to keep people out while maintaining the fiction of an ecological disaster area. Annexing the Annexing the land that comprised Area X, and, a, and double again around it, as a natural expansion of a military base farther up the coast, had helped in that regard. As did the supposed live fire ranges, dotting the area. The army's role had arguably become larger as the southern reach had been downsized. All medical staff and engineers now resided with army command, for example. If a toilet broke down at the Southern Reach, the plumber came over from the military base to fix it. Whitby whipped the jeep from side to side on a rough stretch of road, bringing Cheney alarmingly close. On further inspection, Cheney displayed the remnants of a bodybuilder's physique, as if he had once been fit, but that this condition, like all human conditions, had receded and then reconstituted itself in the increased thickness around his waist. But in receding had left behind a still solid chest, jutting forward through the white shirt, out from the brown jacket, in a triumphant way that almost gave cover to his gut. He was also, according to his file, a first-rate scientist, partial to beer. The kind of mind control had seen before. It needed dulling to slow it down or to distance itself from the possibility of despair. Beer versus scientist represented a kind of schism between the banality of speech versus the originality of thought. An ongoing battle. Why would Cheney play the buffoon to control when he was in fact a mighty brain? Well, maybe he was a buffoon, outside of his chosen field, but then Control wasn't exactly anyone's first invitee to a cocktail party, either. Once they'd put the major wow. Once they'd put the distraction of the major checkpoints behind them and entered the stretch of fifteen miles of gravel road, which seemed to take all of Whitby's attention, so he continued to say little. Control asked, "Is this, uh, should it be? Is this the route that expedition would take to the border too?" <laughs> depends on the gravel road and depends. Well, it's an open. They'd be shouting. They're in a jeep. It's probably got an open... Never mind. Never mind. I'm not going to do that again. The longer they had been traveling... Is this the route that the expedition would take to the border, too? The longer they had been traveling, the more the image in his head of the progress of the expeditions down this very road, each member quiet, alone in the vast expanse of their thoughts, had been interrupted by the stage business of lurching to a stop at so many checkpoints. The destruction of Solace. Sure, Cheney said, but in a special bus that doesn't need to stop. A special bus. No checkpoints. 
No limousine for the expeditions, not on this road. Were they allowed last meal requests? Was the night before often a drunken reverie or more of a somber meditation? When was the last time they were allowed to see family or friends? Did they receive religious counsel? The files didn't say. Central descended on the southern reach like a many-limbed uber-parasite to coordinate that part. Loaded down or unencumbered? And already with their backpacks and uh, and already with their backpacks and equipment, he asked. He was seeing the biologist on that special bus, sans checkpoints, fiddling with her pack or sitting there silent with it beside her on the seat. Nervous or calm? No matter what her state of mind at that point, Control guessed she would not have been talking to her fellow expedition members. No, they get all that at the border facility, but they'd know what was in. St- but they'd know what was in it before that. It'd be the same as their training packs, just fewer rocks. Again, the look that meant he was supposed to laugh, but always considerate. Cheney chuckled for him yet again. So, approaching the border, was Ghostbird elated, indifferent? It frustrated him that he had a better sense of what she wouldn't be than what she was. We used to joke, Cheney said, interrupted by a pothole poorly navigated by Whitby. Uh, We used to joke that we ought to send them in with an abacus and a piece of flint, Uh, maybe a rubber band or two. In checking Control's reaction to his levity, Cheney must have seen something disapproving or dangerous, because he added, Gallows humor, you know, like in an ER. ER, sorry. Except he hadn't been the one on the gallows. He'd stayed behind and analyzed what they'd brought back. The ones who did come back. A whole storeroom of largely useless samples, bought with blood and careers, because hardly any of the survivors went on to have happy, productive lives. Did Ghostbird remember Cheney? And if so, what was her impression of him? The endless ripple of scaly brown tree trunks, the smell of pine needles mixed with a pungent whiff of decay and the exhaust from the jeep. The blue-gray sky above, through the scattered canopy. The back of Whitby's swaying head. Whitby, invisible, and yet all too visible. The cipher who came in and out of focus seemed both near and far. The terror, Whitby had said during the morning meeting, staring at the plant and the mouse. The terror. But oddly, slurring it slightly, and in a tone as if he were imparting information rather than reacting or expressing an emotion. Terror sparked by what? Why said with such apparent enthusiasm? But the linguist talked over Whitby and soon pushed so far beyond the moment that Control couldn't go back to it at the time. Her name conveys a whole series of related associations, Sue had said, launching some more primordial section of her PowerPoint, created during a different era and perhaps initially pitched to an audience of the frozen megafauna Control remembered so vividly from the Natural History Museum. A set of related ideas, facts, etc., and these associations exist not just in the mind of the one named, form their identity, but also in the minds of the other expedition members, and thus accessible to whatever else might access them in Area X, even if by a process unknown to us and purely speculative in nature. Whereas, biologist, that's a function, a subset of a full identity. Not if you did it right, like Ghostbird, and you were totally and wholly your job to begin with. If you can be your function, then the theory is that these associations narrow or close down, and that closes down the pathways into personality. Perhaps. Except Control knew that wasn't the only reason to take away names. It was to strip personality away for the starker purpose of instilling loyalty, and to make conditioning and hypnosis more effective. Which, in turn, helped mitigate or stave off the effects of Area X. 
or at least that was the rationale Control had seen in the files, as put forward in a note by James Lowry, the only survivor of the first expedition, and a man who had stayed on at the Southern Reach despite being damaged and taking years to recover. Overtaken by some sudden thought she chose not to share, Sue then performed her own pivot, like Grace through the hallway maze. We keep saying it, and by it I mean whatever initiated these processes and perhaps used Saul Evans's words is like this thing or that is like this thing or that or like that thing. But it isn't. It is only itself whatever it is, because our minds process information almost solely through analogy and categorization. We are often defeated when presented with something that fits no category and lies outside the realm of our analogies. Control imagined the PowerPoint coming to a close, the series of marbled borders giving way to a white screen with the word questions on it. Still, Control understood the point. It echoed, in a different way, things the biologist had said during their session. In college, what had always stuck with him in Astronomy 101 was that the first astronomers to think of points of light not as part of a celestial tapestry revolving around the Earth, but as individual stars, had had to wrench their imaginations, and thus their analogies and metaphors, out of a grooved track that had been running through everyone's minds for hundreds and hundreds of years. Who at the Southern Reach had the kind of mind needed to see something new? Probably not Cheney at this point. Cheney's roving intellect had uncovered nothing new for quite some time, possibly through no real fault of its own. Yet Control came back to one thought, Cheney's willingness to keep banging his head against a wall, despite the fact that he would never publish any scientific papers about any of this, was in a perverse way, one of the best reasons to assume the director had been competent. Gray moss clinging to trees. A hawk circling a clear-cut meadow under skies growing darker. A heat and humidity to the air that was trying to defeat the rush of wind past them. The Southern Reach called the last expedition the 12th, but Control had counted the rings, and it was actually the 38th iteration, including six 11th expeditions. The hagiography was clear. I think that's hagiography, not hagiography. I'm pretty sure it's a soft G on hagiography. After the, tr <laughs> the hagiography was clear. After the true fifth expedition, the Southern Reach had gotten stuck like a jammed CD, with nearly the same repetitions. Expedition 5 became X5A, followed by X5B and X5C, all the way to an X5G. Each expedition number thereafter adhered to a particular set of metrics and introduced variables into the equation with each letter. For example, the 11th expedition series had been composed of all men, while the 12th, if it continued to X12B and beyond, would continue to be composed of all women. He wondered if his mother knew of any parallel in special ops, if secret studies showed something about gender that escaped him in considering the irrelevance of this particular metric. And what about someone who didn't identify as male or female? Control still couldn't tell from his examination of the records that morning if the iterations had started as a clerical error and become codified as a process— unlikely, or had been initiated as a conscious decision by the director, sneakily enacted below the radar of any meeting minutes. It had just popped up as if always there. A need to somehow act as if they weren't as far along without con concrete results or answers. Or the need to describe a story arc for each set of expeditions that didn't give away how futile it was fast becoming. During the fifth, too, the Southern Reach had started lying to the participants. No one was ever told they were part of Expedition 7F, or 8G, or 9B, and Control wondered how anyone had kept it straight, and how the truth might have eaten away at morale, eaten away at morale, rather than buoyed it.
buoyed it, brought into the southern reach a kind of cynical fatalism. How, pe how peculiar to keep prepping the fifth expedition, to keep rolling this stone up this hill, over and over. Grace had just shrugged when asked about the transition from X-11K to X-12A during orientation on Monday, which already felt a month away from Wednesday. The biologist knew about the 11th expedition because her husband was careless, so we moved on to the 12th. Was that the only reason? A lot of accommodations were made for, bu for the biologist, Control observed. The director ordered it, Grace said, and I stood behind her. That was the end of that line of inquiry. Grace no longer willing to admit that there might have been any distance between her and the director. And, as often happened, one big lie had let in a series of little lies, under the guise of changing the metrics, of altering the experiment. So that as they got diminishing returns, the director fiddled more and more with the composition of the expeditions, and fiddled with what information she told them, and who knew if any of it had helped anything at all. You reached a certain point of desperation, perhaps thought the train was coming faster than others did, and you'd use whatever you found hidden under the seats, whether a weapon or just a bent paper clip. If you quacked like a scientist, and waddled like a scientist, soon, to non-scientists, you became the subject under discussion, and not a person at all. Some scientists lived within this role, almost embraced it, transformed into walking theses or textbooks. This couldn't be said about Cheney, though, despite lapses into jargon like quantum entanglements. At a certain point on the way to the border, Control began to collect Cheneyisms. Much of it came to Control unsolicited, because he found that Cheney, once he got warmed up, hated silence, and threw into that silence a strange combination of erudite and sloppy syntax. All Control had to do, with Whitby as his innocent accomplice, was not respond to a joke or comment, and Cheney would fill up the space with his own words. Jesus, it was a long drive. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of enabling of each other's dipshittery. It's almost all we've got. We don't even understand how every organism on our planet works. Haven't even identified them all yet. What if we don't what if we just don't have the language for it? Are we obsolete? I think not. I think not. But don't ask the Army's opinion of that. A circle looks at a square and sees a badly made circle. As a physicist, what do you do when you're faced by something that doesn't care what you do and isn't affected by your actions? Then you start thinking about dark energy, and you go a little nuts. Yeah, it's about it's something we think about. How do you know if something is out of the ordinary when you don't know if your instruments would register the progressions? Lasers, gravitational wave detectors, x-rays... Nothing useful there. I got this spade here and a bucket and some rubber bands and duct tape, you know? Hardly any scientists at Central, either. Am I right? I guess it's kind of strange to practically live next to this. I guess I could say that. But then you go home, and you're home. Do you know any physics? Nah, of course you don't. How could you? Black holes and waves have a similar structure, you know? Very, very similar, as it turns out. Who would have expected that? I mean, you'd expect Area X to cooperate at least a little bit, right? I'd have staked my reputation on it cooperating with us enough to get some accurate readings, at least. An abnormal heat signature or something. Later, a refinement of this statement. There is some agreement among us now, reduced though we may be, that to analyze certain things, an object must allow itself to be analyzed, must agree to it even if this is simply by way of uh, some response, some reaction. These last two utterances, jostling elbows, Cheney had offered up a bit plaintively, because, in fact, he, ha he had staked his reputation to Area X, in the general sense that the Southern Reach had become his career. 
The initial glory of it, of being chosen, and then the constriction of it, like a great snake named Area X, was suffocating him, and then also what he had to know in his innermost thoughts, or even coursing across the inner rind of his brain. That the Southern Reach had indeed destroyed his career, perhaps even been the reason for his divorce. How do you feel about the all of the misinformation given to the expeditions? Control asked Cheney, if only to push back against the flood of Cheneyisms. He knew Cheney had had some influence in shaping that misinformation. Cheney's frown made it seem as if Control's question were akin to criticizing the paint job on a car that had been involved in a terrible accident. Was Control a killjoy to want to snuff out Cheney's can-do, his can't-help-it brand of the jowly jovial? But Jovial grated on control most of the time. Jovial had always been a pretext, from the high school football team's locker room on... From... Oh, I see. Jovial had always been a pretext, from the high school football team's locker room on, the kind of hearty banter that covered up greater and lesser crimes. It wasn't... isn't really misinformation. Cheney said, and then went dark for a moment, searching for words. Possibly he thought it was a test. Of loyalty, or attitude, or moral rigor. But he found words soon enough. It's more like creating a story or a narrative to guide them through the narrows. An anchor. Like a lighthouse that distracted them from topographical anomalies. A lighthouse that seemed by its very function to provide safety. Maybe Cheney told himself that particular story about the tale, or tale about the story, but Control doubted the director had seen it that way, or even a biologist with only partial memory. Jesus, this is a long drive, Cheney said into the silence. And with that, I actually have to dip. I apologize. Uh, I got to run. I'm sorry that I'm doing it just as... Optical Antenna is uh, <laughs> is tuning in again. I apologize, but uh, I gotta run. Uh, you have the entire rest of it to listen to, I guess. Um, next week, we get to learn vocabulary. We get a new word. Some of you may know the word already. I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, you've already had a hint as to what the, the word is. I... I'm not sure before reading this that I had known the word. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's probably where we'll wind up. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll learn a new word, so that'll be good. Um, to anyone tuning in live who isn't the usual suspects, hi. I do this live every Friday. Um, to anyone tuning in, watching this on YouTube, as you probably are, I think is infinitely more likely because my hours are weird. Uh, I do this live. Hi. <laughs> I do this live at uh, about noon Eastern Standard Time every Friday, which is uh, easily the least likely time that anyone's going to ever tune in. And sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. That's just how the schedule shook out. Um, that may be changing in the future. I'll definitely let people know ahead of time uh, if and or when it does. I may also be expanding my schedule depending on what free time I get freed up. Uh, it may only be a temporary seasonal thing, but we'll see. Um, I'm not going to make any promises or hold out too many hopes at this stage because I just don't know. I'm in a groove. The groove works. <laughs> and I don't like change. Um... I don't like change, so being in the groove is great. Uh, so yeah, I do other streams throughout the week, but they're they're whatever. Um, my Mecha Monday stream, actually, I may be converting into another reading stream for at least a little while because I've got a couple good uh, giant robot related things that I can insert there, so they'll be topical both ways. Um, including, oh gosh, what's his name? What's his name? Uh, like a week ago, ah, shoot, I don't have it anymore. So like a week or two ago, uh, okay, I knew about this person more than a week or two ago, but they have 
written or are writing, I should say, a ballad in the style of Beowulf um, called... Cosmic Warlord Kin Bright. Um, and there are now three chapters of it, I believe, uh, or books of it. They're relatively short three installments, and I had the great fortune of uh, hearing them read it aloud live, uh, I don't know, two weeks ago maybe, um, which was great. Uh, it was really good. Um, mostly because it was like, oh, okay, it's been so long since I've had to hear this kind of meter read, and hearing it read aloud gave me a good sense of the syntax that I'd be using if I were to do the same. I kind of don't want to step on their toes. Um, but at the same time, uh, if I could just find their name. What is their name? What is their name? Scroll to the top. By an individual named uh, Thali Arcus, T H A L I A R C H U S. If he winds up doing more of those, um, definitely, definitely check those out because that was that was rad. That was a great experience. He also, I'm also amazed that he had the viewership that he had, which I think comes of actually using social media. <laughs> there were like, I don't know, like 40 people there. It was wild. I was like, wow, why are 40 people here? I have no idea. But I'm like, awesome. That's great. Uh, especially since, you know, he's, he's, he's an aspiring creator of a uh, of written word. And uh, support, support people who do that. Uh, I'm all for it. Uh, I'm not a creative type. I, I believe I've made great record of this. I am not a creative type. Now you'd think, oh, you read so much, you should be able to make a book easily. And I'm like, yeah, honestly, I probably could if, you know, I found anything desirable in that prospect. But I don't. Um, I'd rather just read it because <laughs> I'm lazy or not creative. Also, I'd feel like it was just the rote components and tropisms that I'd be inserting together. I need to find a link. That's the problem. And I'm trying to do that right now. <laughs> like I'm, I'm like clicking around trying to find the thing. Um, let me... Uh, it's the definition of Kanathaliarchus. Okay, there's the Twitter. Where's their Where's their Twitch? Yeah, that's definitely him. Yep. Ah, here we go. They have them available. Here we go. Copy pasta. I could, but like again, it's. It's the creative process entire that I, I really don't, I, I get, no, I can't. Can't, never could, I know, I know. Uh, but it's it's like, it's not that it's hard to type. I can type much faster than I could speak, um, probably. Um, but like, I just, I would, I would get real hung up on a lot of minutia that I just, I don't have the energy for, sadly. Um, also, I'd know that I was faking it. Like, I, I would not be, like, I'm again, I'm just not a creative type. People sometimes are resistant to that concept. Like, how could you, how could you say you're not creative? And I'm like, because I'm not. <laughs> I, I know, I know my limits. I know I am much better at reading something and analyzing something or absorbing something than I am actually creating something. That said, I know a lot of the tropisms and uh, what have you a lot of the common forms. I know some people treat tropes like they're a dirty word, and I think that's got something to do with the community that sprung up, uh, the behavior of the community that sprung up over at like tvtropes.com or whatever. Um, but tropisms are a very real thing. I'm sorry. Like that's, it's, that. It, could you argue that it's a result of over-analysis? Yes, probably. But like when you see recurring themes, you realize there isn't a single original thought in existence. And that's kind of what keeps me from being, cre being a creative type is I'd be like, well, what's the point? It's just screaming into the void, which is kind of how I feel about doing this. But 
this at least is easy. So that's a link to uh, Cosmic Warlord Kin Bright that they have on their itch.io page. Uh, it's got books one through three. I've got to get book three downloaded. Um, they're not very long. Like each book is like 20 something pages long. I think book two is actually substantially, no, it's, it's shorter actually than book one. Um, it's very much food for thoughty. It's very good. Um, I don't see here a link to their Twitch, which is a crying shame. More information in development. No, 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 no. I suppose I could go on to Twitch. T-W-I-T-C-H TV. Look up Thaliarchus. I think it was under that name. Thaliarchus. Oh my god, shut up. I love how things just autoplay. There we go. If you're here, <laughs> he says, <laughs> you know who I am. <laughs> I imagine you know who I am. I could do the same thing, but I've got my actual skitter, sk schedule posted there. I think I've got it posted on YouTube as well, but I, the YouTube inf interface does things that I don't like. Here we go. I'll post their, um, I'll post their Twitch channel. I don't know if they've got a YouTube. I haven't looked for that yet. Um, but that's great. I would kind of like to read this stuff aloud. Um, but uh, he's kind of already done it. Um, I also have a bunch of actual giant robot no adjacent novels that I'd love to tackle. Uh, I've, I've mentioned most of these before, like the original novelization of uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, which is quite a trip. Um, Full Metal Panic, which is now fully translated, except for some of the side story fluff. Um, and that's an enjoyable rom-com with giant robots. Um, honestly maybe more entertaining than the tv series that was made of it it's 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 genuinely good like it might be one of the best translation jobs i've ever gone through translating from japanese into english it is not stiff at all it is it flows well it doesn't seem to take many liberties from what i've gathered from people who've actually read the original source material uh more stiff would be Legend of the Galactic Heroes, which is um, very stiff, uh, but that's partly due to how it's written. It's written to be sort of like um, uh, pseudo-historical documentary stuff, so it's it's quite dry. Um, lots of high drama, but also like 12 volumes long. They're not very long volumes, but there's 12 of them. So, back burner for that. Bunch of other good stuff. I'd love to read uh, Yukikaze uh, just in general, because that's, that's just an excellent sci-fi novel. Um, and then there's a bunch of other non-sci-fi things I'd kind of like to get around to reading at some point in any case, but that's, that's, that's right now I'm locked in. Like I am doing authority. We're going to finish authority. We're like, what, a quarter of the way done. Where's the end of authority here? I have to actually go through pages. Jeez Louise. Holy spinoli. Hey, no, wait, that might be the beginning of the next book. Una momento. No, I don't think it is. Come on, that is a long chapter. Good golly. Okay, is there like an index that gives me a page number? Come on. I'm sorry, this is embarrassing. There we go. Authority starts on page 129, ends on page 359. Uh, so we are, call it a quarter of the way through. I don't know. Maybe more. Probably closer to a third. I don't know. Anyway, um, I've got that. I've got the final volume of the Area X slash Southern Reach trilogy, uh, which is Acceptance, um, lined up. So that's one and three quarters books, two thirds books. Um, I've got the last two volumes of um, the Rifters trilogy, which are both collectively the third book uh, of Behemoth uh, for the Rifters trilogy, but that's separatable into two different volumes. And so what we'll be doing is we'll get through Authority, we'll do the first volume of the last book of the Rifters trilogy, and then we'll switch over to Acceptance, and then the last, last part of the Rifters series. Um, after that, everything is kind of murky and dim. I'm hoping I won't have to interrupt any of those to do 
uh, a thing that I want to do for uh, June. Um, I think it's June. That's uh, that's when I wanted to do that. Whenever what I wanted to do that, um, involving a now somewhat infamous short story. Um, and uh, it's going to be kind of, I'm going to be reading the short story and I'm going to be doing kind of an overview of it, kind of an, an analysis breakdown, not necessarily of the story, but of the fallout, um, because I think that it bears talking about and it needs to be talked about. Um, and this ties into what I'm talking about, about supporting your creative types, um, because sometimes they're trying, okay, and sometimes they're trying in good faith to just come up with a cool story and not trying to rock the boat. Well, I mean, they're trying to rock the boat, which is why they're doing what they're doing. They're doing something creative to rock the boat. They're doing it to be noticed or whatever reasons they have, because it's cathartic. I don't know. I, I don't derive catharsis from creation, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so that's, that's why I have difficulty um, <clears throat> with the concept. School was hard in that regard. That part of school, anyway. Uh, so yeah, with that, I got to run now that I've rambled. Um, do check out Thaliarchus. Thaliarchus? Which is an actual Latin word. I don't remember what it is now. It's been a zillion years. I was like, oh, I know that word. I don't know what it means. I don't remember. You can find it. It's probably, you can use, you can use whatever search engine you care to use to do that. I don't know. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to run. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, stay safe, stay sane, be decent to each other. Um, I am not a hundred percent confident that I'm going to get to reading the, uh, Mecha Monday stuff this next week because I've got a lot going on and I, I, I that's going to require actual prep and, um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Assume that I'm not for now. If I am, you'll find out about it the next week, whatever. Anyway. Thanks again. Stay safe, stay sane, be decent to each other, be toasty or cool as per your preference. Did I say be decent to each other? Yeah, do that, please. Seriously, it's worth a shot. Um, if someone's being a complete head-ass at you, you know what? Uh, use the old uh, Bob Dobbs cult of the sub-genius joke. Uh, or line, rather. Fuck them if they can't take a joke, because honestly... Life sometimes feels like it is one. Not a very entertaining joke, to be honest. It feels like it feels like this space shuttle joke my dad used to tell when he wanted to make everyone really cringe at how long somebody could just talk about something really dumb. <sighs> I'll have to rig it. I will have to do a stream where I do that. Incidentally, the first is coming up, but it's not on a stream day. So I can't viably come up with a... Because last year, some may remember... Uh, April 1st and Free Read Fridays meshed perfectly, and I did um, excerpts, an excerpt, from the Frank Zappa autobiography, and it was a good time. I enjoyed myself. I don't care who knows it. Um, if ever something like that should occur again, I'd love to do the same thing, um, or something similar. Um, I missed, there was an opportunity like two or three years ago where I had an opportunity to do one for another stream and I completely spaced because I don't pay attention to things like dates, uh, for ironic holidays and ironic holidays incidentally includes Hallmark holidays, uh, which is basically anything with a bright color associated with it that is clearly done entirely to sell chocolate, Hallmark cards, candy, whatever. Um, this includes most holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the holidays we Americans hold near and dear, like St. Patty's Day, or St. Valentine's Day, or, honestly, probably Thanksgiving. Uh, I could go and do a whole diatribe on the nature of the o origins of Thanksgiving, but I think most people either already know it, or those who don't want to know it aren't going to want to know it, so we're not going to go there, because it's horrible. Um... What's the other one? That, oh, Easter. I I mean, technically that's a religious holiday, but that that one's been completely, completely uh, subverted by 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 capitalism at this point. So it has no actual fucking meaning. Um, I say very much the same thing about Christmas, but uh, that tends to get dark, dark stares <laughs> from certain individuals with whom I have to actually associate occasionally. So I keep that shit on the down low. Sorry. Sorry to everyone. You just learned that Frag doesn't care about Christmas.
Frag actually dislikes that season rather greatly because Frag used to work retail, and you learn quite a lot about human nature working retail around Christmas. And if you're asking, did he ever play Ebenezer Scrooge in a school play? You bet your sweet bippy. Hell yes, Frank Zappa and Captain, Captain Beefheart. Let's go, Bongo Fury. I have a rather complete Captain Beefheart collection. Also a rather complete Frank Zappa collection. So I'm just, I'm just like, I have a little bit of street cred. <laughs> I'd like to say I have a smidgen of street cred in this particular sector. I have niche interests. Giant robots, Frank Zappa, Captain Beefheart, a bit of Warren Zevon. I think I have most of his library by now. There's one or two... Uh, one or two of his I don't think I have, but I'd have to check. And a few other things. I've got very niche interests. Pulp sci-fi from the 30s for some ungodly reason, but it works. It's... I have them. These are the things I do. <laughs> if somebody... I'd love for somebody to write... Act, oh my god, that's what I should do. That should be my writing creative project. I have rambled now for 24 minutes. 20 minutes, sorry. Um, that should be my creative writing project, is uh, I should write a 30s pulp science fiction serial. I could do it. I could do it. I have the source material. Nobody would know. Everyone would know. I would know. Um, I would know, and that's what matters. Jesus Christ. For someone who doesn't believe in Christmas and thinks Easter is a complete joke, you sure say the take the Lord's son's ghost's thing's name in vain. A lot. Oh man, I could, I could do it, dude. I'm not going to do it. I could do it. I could write, I could write 30s pulp. I could do it. I can't believe I'm saying this. I can't believe I'm giving myself more things to do. I do not need more things to do. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm going to leave you all to it. <laughs> I'm going to try and forget that I've had this conversation with myself. <laughs> See you all later. Bye.